came from Germany, from Haunhofer. Jan Hendrik Hammer works there as a research associate in Karlsruhe. And I think because we talked so far about mobile, both first talks in different ways, mobiles, and the qualitative experience, I asked Jan Hendrik to talk a little bit about eye tracking as one more and uh, one different method that can do both the quantitative and maybe the qualitative to support it. But it's a tool as with everything else. So although in this case, what he'll talk more about, it was used in a particular exhibition, again, staying within the arts, and then we'll move on with the next talk. But also to think a little bit about not just on-site interactives or different kind of applications in an exhibition or some kind of cultural heritage display, but maybe also think a little bit about the potential of this method for also gazing users' interaction online, which is what a lot of you have been dealing with, maybe with digital libraries and different kinds of digital collections. So um, I hope. Should work. <laughs> OK, so on to you, Jan. Thank you very much, Maria. It's glad to be in Glasgow. Hello to all of you. Welcome to my presentation. I'm Jan Hendrik Hammer from the KIT in Germany, located in Karlsruhe. And I'm also working closely with some people from the front of IOSB, also located in Karlsruhe. I'm going to talk to you about eye tracking, gaze analysis, and gaze based interaction. So the outline for my talk, I will first mention a few applications where eye tracking is already successfully applied. Um, then I will show you a few mobile and stationary eye tracking devices since I don't know how familiar you are with uh, you are with that technology. And in the third bullet point, I'm going to describe the workflow from eye tracking to gaze analysis, what steps it consists of. And uh, after that, I will give a short example of uh, how we used gaze analysis in an EU project. And at the end, I will... Uh, mention further options for eye tracking that I think are promising for the future. So applications for eye tracking today, first of all, um, it's used as assistive technology for people with disabilities. Some of those people, unfortunately, can only control their eyes. So eye tracking gives them the possibility to interact with the world again. Um, furthermore, it's used for optimizing the user experience and the interaction. For example, in web usability, do the people find the buy button? How long does it take for finding the buy button? Or in marketing and consumer research, um, for example, you can see how people interact with a product, which version of a product is better, or how they perceive advertisements. Do they find the brand? What do they look at during such a video? Um, eye tracking has already been used for comparing the viewing behavior of uh, novice and experts, for example, during sports or also during the perception of artworks. So I will now start with the devices. How many of you have seen eye trackers before? Oh, so maybe 50% of the room. Um, you see these bar-like devices here. Those are stationary eye trackers. They are all positioned below a display, and you can track the gaze on a display. What they all have in common is that um, there is a virtual head box. It's around this size, so 16 centimeters, and your head must be in this virtual head box so that your eyes can be tracked. Then you get the gaze on such a display. Um, the price range is from around 80 pounds to 40,000 pounds. So what you can spend and what you want to spend maybe, or uh, yeah, it depends on how much money you have for a product. This is only the hardware. Um, the software for the gaze analysis itself, because you want to do something with the, the, the eye tracking data, you can use SDKs, which are for free, but then you need to program yourself the software, or you can buy the software again, and it's not that cheap. There are mobile devices also out there. Um, depends on what you want to analyze. So this head box with the stationary devices is quite small and you can only show images on a screen. If you want to see how people interact with a product, if they walk around it, you need such a mobile eye tracker. Nowadays, all of them do bi perform binocular eye tracking. So there are two eye cameras, one for each eye. You see them here. This is one eye camera and this is one eye camera. And here is a scene camera which captures the scene. All those uh, glasses-like devices weight below around 100 grams. Um, and the hardware and the software for live viewing 
is around 80, uh, 1,800 pounds to 10,000 pounds. And what I mean with live viewing is that you can, um, during an uh, experiment, you can see what the person is looking at. So you see the video stream of the scene camera overlaid with the gaze information. Um, but if you want to analyze it automatically, again, you need software for, for that. Again, you have SDKs or you buy software which is around 8,000 um, pounds. And there is another step which is needed for uh, analyzing the data afterwards. It's a post-processing step. You need to annotate gaze data for the gaze registration because the algorithms don't know where the point of regard it computes is on, so which object you are currently focusing. Um, and this gaze annotation step takes a lot of time. So at least for one minute of gaze data, it takes around five minutes. So imagine uh, an experiment with 10 minutes of lasting for 10 minutes. You need 50 minutes for annotation. You can go another way. It's a fully automatic process, but therefore you need a pose estimation. And this pose estimation, you need further hardware for, um, or mostly this option, there's no further hardware needed. It's called inside out tracking, but you need to attach markers into the scene. So these markers need to be distributed over the scene. And then the video of the scene camera is used to capture those markers. And then with, uh, using some computer vision algorithms, you can compute the pose. The pose is um, the orientation of the eye tracker in the world and the position. Um, of course, those markers are somehow distracting the visual attention because they are superficial uh, objects which usually are not there. Um, but you can go for outside in tracking. You need to attach cameras in the world, in the room, and attach some marker to the eye tracking device. Um, and then you can do this pose estimation. But again, the costs, you can really spend this much money if you want to, for example, well, this much money will not be enough for this whole room for eye tracking. So let's come to the next point, um, the workflow from eye tracking to gaze analysis. Um, I divide gaze analysis in total into three steps, eye tracking, gaze movement, computation, and gaze analysis. Let's start with the eye tracking. Eye tracking consists of the line of sight reconstruction and the gaze point computation. So after eye tracking, we know where the gaze is directed to. And this is one geometrical model that can be used to uh, compute the line of sight. The line of sight is this blue line here. And it's important, it goes through the nodal point of the optical system of our eye and goes to the fovea. The fovea is the area we use to see sharp with. Um, here is the eye camera and here is a light source. Uh, emitting infrared light, which we don't see, so it does not disturb us. And um, this is what the camera sees. It somehow reminded me of the second moon app image with the, with, with the Earth and the moon. But here you see the pupil, and here you see the reflection of this, uh, of this infrared light source. Um, again, using computer vision, those are detected, and you can compute, or by applying this model, you can compute the line of sight. So you know the orientation relatively to the eye camera here, but then you still need to know where is the eye camera in the room, or from that you can compute where is this nodal point. And therefore, again, for mobile devices, you need this post estimation I already talked about. So now we know where this line of sight is, but if you want to know what is looked at, we still need to know where is something in the room. So in the EU Project ArtSense, we created um, 3D models of museums, uh, of some mu museum rooms, for example, the Valencian Kitchen, depicted here in the National Museum of Decorative Arts, or the laborator Laboratory of Lavoisier uh, at the Musée des Arts et Métiers in Paris. And this is the smart control room. It's a multi-display environment at our institute in Karlsruhe, where we do some interaction stuff. So now we know where the line of sight is, where it starts, the direction, and we know the 3D environment and then we can compute this gaze point here. So for example, now we know the person is directing the eyes to this point. And as you see, we use this inside out tracking with the markers. Those markers are, were really big, around 60 times 16, 16 times 16 centimeters. Nowadays, the scene cameras have a better resolution and they can be smaller. So if we have done the eye tracking, we need to compute the gaze movements because our scan pass consists of uh, several types of movements. 
And the most important are uh, fixations and saccades. Fixations are those periods of time where you focus on something and where you perceive, where, where you are perceiving what you look at. And during those, uh, between those fixations, you have saccades, which are ballistic movements where the eye jumps directly from one fixation to another fixation. And during those saccades, we do not perceive anything. So um, it's important to get rid of those. Here you see an example of five minutes of gaze data in the Valencian kitchen here and in the laboratory of Lavoisier. Um, the gaze you see is dis distributed over the whole scene. These are the gaze points in violet. And transferred to fixations, it looks like this. The radius of a fixation sphere is corresponding with the duration of that fixation. And adding saccades, it could look like this. So for example, here you see how the gaze wandered over the scene. It started on the left, went to the right, and went back again over the scene. So that's it for the gaze movement computation. Let's come to the gaze analysis. There are several metrics out there you can use for gaze analysis. I will concentrate only on the area of interest-based metrics. Areas of interest are regions or volumes in a room that are of interest. So you can see them here in orange. Um, it's just the hull of, an, of, of objects that were of interest. And during the, uh, the eye tracking, you can then see or uh, detect automatically when an area of interest like this object here is hit. So I will now go for the cumulative fixation time. The cumulative fixation time is simply the sum of the durations of all the fixations on an area of interest. And that can, for example, be used for gaze analysis, as I will show you in the following example. In the EU project ArtSense, we conducted uh, an experiment, and it was parted in two types. The first type was um, that the subjects were freely viewing the artwork, which in this case was the kitchen wall. We wanted to know how do the subjects look at the scene and what are the most attractive areas. In the second type of experiment, we added an audio guide to that uh, experiment, and we wanted to know do the people follow the told stories. Here you see gaze data visualized as a normalized heat map. The red areas are those areas where the attention was higher than in the green areas. And on the left side, you see the results for one subject uh, during the freely viewing experiment. So you can see the gaze is concentrated on, for example, faces, on objects in the scene, but it's evenly distributed over the whole scene. And compared to the results for the experiment with audio guide, you see directly that the gaze is concentrated in the lower part. And of course, the information told by the audio guide was about the persons and uh, what happens here in the lower part. Using the cumulative fixation time, we can assert this. Um, you see that 86% of the cumulative fixation time was spent on this lower part um, the audio guide was giving information to, compared to the freely viewing part where it was <coughs> almost uh, even. If we look at the scan pass, you've already seen this scan pass here. It was during the freely viewing type. The gaze quickly wandered over, a few fixations from left to right and back again. And if you look at the scan pass with the audio guide, you see more fixations on, for example, the heads or the faces, um, on the dress of this lady which was talked about, what she's carrying in her hand, about the stuff placed on these tablets here. And for example, this cup is falling down from the tablet, so you can see here this was also part of the stories. And um, also the dress of this lady here. So as answer, what can eye tracking give us? It can be an indicator for how good this audio guide worked. And in this case, we see that the information given was visually followed. Another possibility for eye tracking you can look at smaller time windows, for example, four second time frame. And if you see that in the four, tecond, uh, four second time frame at time t, that only this, these two servants and these two tablets were in uh, focus of attention, you go one second further, you see the third tablet is also here. 
Um, you could use this for a recommendation system, which was uh, the goal of the ArtSense project. So this um, system should detect the interest of the person and then give recommendations, for example, information in an audio guide or uh, as planned in, an aug uh, in augmented reality glasses. So that's it for the example of uh, gaze analysis. I will now show you some examples for gaze-based interaction. Um, you see an observer here. He's looking at a screen where you have nine different uh, streams of observation cameras. And his job now is to find something suspicious. When he sees something suspicious, he wants to go, he wants to focus on that stream and see what is happening there. So imagine him sitting there for maybe half an hour and nothing is happening and suddenly something happens. He's moving from his chair up, trying to find the mouse. He grabbed the mouse, now he doesn't find the mouse pointer. So he has to move the mouse around to find the mouse pointer. I don't know if you experience this, but I experience that every day. Um, you see the mouse pointer, then you again look to the suspicious thing that happened and move the mouse pointer to the location, you click, and then um, it's focused into the image. Uh, it's fo uh, the stream is, is highlighted, as you can see there. And what you see here, he's only moving his thumb. So we replace this targeting process, which involves these few steps um, I, I described before, by using the eye tracking device. So it simply looks at a stream, presses a key, and the, the application is zooming into that window. So this is really, really intuitive. Um, and I know I, I, I can't talk about it so much as I want. You will not directly believe me as long as you haven't experienced it. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring an eye tracker with me. Um, but I've also controlled Windows using an eye tracker around one year ago. So that's really great and definitely to come. Here is another example. I already mentioned the smart control room where we um, select things on monitors. And therefore, we, need, uh, we use pointing gestures. You see this colleague? He is selecting those buttons in this uh, cross-like pattern and can do this in front of this whole uh, video wall. And uh, therefore, we also compared this interaction technique to gaze-based interaction. And I mean, it's obvious. As you see, using the gaze, you can move much quicker and it's much less exhaustive than moving around the arm. So. Again, we had the inside-out tracking here with those markers. OK. And now let's come to the end. So first interesting stuff. Um, a few months ago, I met some guys uh, from Isaac.de. And um, they are using only the webcam for a gaze analysis. Um, and I sent them the image of, or it's from Wikipedia, I think, uh, from the Duke of Wellington. And they put it into their software. and. Um, just looked at it, and I mean, you can see uh, it's a result we would expect. The cone is in the focus of attention at most. <laughs> uh, what's nice with this thing is, um, if you use the webcam, you, 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 of course, you need to invite those people for the study, but they can sit on the other side of the world, so you don't need them to, be to, to come to you and sit in front of that stationary eye tracker. Um, and another thing I really th find interesting is this VR stuff. You probably all have heard of Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. Um, we have this device uh, at our institute since maybe two weeks, and it's it's really it's it's awesome. You you <coughs> you dive into this virtual world, and the the immersion is fantastic. You move around, you don't get sick, um, and it's compared or. You can, you can buy eye trackers for not this device, but for other devices. And it's a matter of time when we have eye trackers for all those devices. Um, but it's like mobile eye tracking with the pose estimation solved, which is so expensive. So if you create your 3D world and the subject dives into this world, you can directly do the eye tracking and the gaze analysis automatically. So that will solve one of the cost problems. OK, to sum up, um, what do you want the people to look at? If it's just an image on a display, you go for stationary eye tracking. If you need larger volumes, 
you go for mobile eye tracking. I talked about the workflow from eye tracking over gaze movement computation to gaze analysis. Um, showed you examples for gaze-based interaction using gaze key press and uh, mentioned some alternatives to usual eye tracking and eye tracking in VR. Thank you for your attention and it's time for questions, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing, I think, quite sophisticated and powerful technology, which raises quite a lot of questions. For example, okay, we know what they're looking at, but why are they looking at these things? <laughs> it's the most important one, probably. Um, but it's interesting in the wealth of data, and I think it complements the qualitative questions and analysis we're uh, talking about a bit earlier, of trying to understand the experience and the art engagement well, with this is you have really whatever they think they remember and the ambiguity of the data. Maybe it was last week, I'm not so sure, but I'm sure about the feelings that one of the users was telling in RIT's example. Here, no matter what they think they remember, it's 100% this records really with a f high degree of accuracy, if I understood it right, exactly what they're looking at. But it's, I think that's the next step then for further analysis of trying to understand what the eye gazing means, or at least that was my understanding. I don't know if any of you had any comments or questions for Jan. Okay, you do. I mean, only because you look at something, it doesn't mean you're interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> That's clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the fascinating presentation, because um, I've used eye tracking before, but only the desktop, and I hadn't mm -hmm. you know, seen all the different ways you could use eye tracking. But, but just thinking of Maria's question, you can, presumably you can also not just using eye tracking, but, but also look at, link it up with some kind of video analysis so you can look at who's looking at what. Mm -hmm. So maybe not just asking why they're looking at things, but maybe measuring things like facial expression when they're looking at different things and try and map that to maybe experiences of looking at something as well as just what they're looking at. I mean, so there's maybe you're looking at the objects, but also looking at the person who's looking at the objects as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean uh, that's uh, a way we are we are currently doing that in a, in another project where we have people who um, use the eye camera and uh, camera which is a little bit further away to to get the facial expressions. But for sur it's for surgeons yeah. where you have this thing before your mouth, so it's even more difficult. But you can the facial actual coding system for detecting what the person may think and add it to the gaze data. You picked it up and it came out of what they said. So that gaze analysis does not actually equate to cognitive engagement, right? It just because they've looked yeah. doesn't mean they've actually perceived or seen. It doesn't actually necessarily mean that they haven't seen broader than that particular point that you've picked them up as seeing at. Now, I can't remember the name of the, the, the Russian scientist that did the experiment. Um, but uh, I picked it up actually from Engelman's seri series on the brain, mm -hmm. um, where he did an experiment where people came into a room and they looked at a picture, and then they were asked to describe what they actually saw. Mm -hmm. So the question that I really have for you is, have you looked at combining gaze analysis with evaluations of what people actually think they saw? No, we did by questioning them experiments. and asking them what mm -hmm. they perceive, because that would allow you to really understand the meaningfulness, yeah. or it might give you some some insights into the meaningfulness of using gaze analysis to understanding w what perception's about. Yeah. It was not part of, of that study, but uh, of course one should do that when you perform eye tracking studies. Um, but um, one thing that comes into my mind, if you um, if you look at poker players, when they have a good, when they have good cards, the pupil diameter is getting bigger for a short uh, amount of time. So that's why some people wear glasses during the poker playing. Um, it m it might be one indicator for how some how much somebody is engaged with that, and if you really see this, but yeah. 
Yeah, um, I just wondered when you were talking about the, f the difference between freely looking at something and then when somebody was looking at an audio and they were engaging with it, um, what, have you done any experiments with groups? So like if people are discussing what they're looking at in a gallery and how that affects, you know, do you understand what I mean? Sorry. No, we, we did not do that. So it was simply no. this, we sent the subject into the room. Yeah and told him, the left wall, please, only the left yeah. wall. Um, <laughs> and after that, uh, the subject got the audio guide and went again into the room ah, okay. and looked at the scene. But do you think that's something you would do? Is that quite valuable for like a, a, to have that kind of discussion between people and see if that affects the, do you know what I mean? It probably has an influence. Yeah, yeah, just because, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Just like the experience side of things rather than the, yeah. Difficult to give an answer to yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not an expert for these studies. I'm more the technical guy, uh, which is for the eye tracking itself, but... Uh, I wonder whether, because <coughs> we talk a lot about galleries and museums, and I wonder whether this, the gaze analysis is, as you say, is most important for people that have any disabilities. It's for market research and that kind of stuff. What might interest me is when one plans an exhibition or plans a new, a new building plan, like a museum or a gallery, and you might want to experiment with seeing when someone enters my room, what do they look at first in my room? Not, not, not so much about how they interact with paintings, not about the emotion that comes out of studying a piece of art, but actually applying this maybe to how to concept an exhibition. Um, what do people focus on when they enter a building? What do they think when they land on their website, on your website? What, what, where do they go first? What, you know, so you could use that maybe for more the analytical as in how to build your concept around something, and not so much about emotions. But I think this is where maybe if that gazing eye tracking was extremely uh, available and, and everyone could just buy it for 50 pound. I think that's where I would apply it. So this is probably the entry time to an area of interest, what you mentioned, what, are the, what is somebody looking at first? So this gives you some kind of information about the attractiveness of an object. Um, but for eye tracking, I should mention you need to mostly or nowadays you need to calibrate the eye trackers so using eye tracking nowadays in a real setting is still challenging so as a working product in a museum it's really challenging thank you so much i found that really really fascinating um, and really um, useful as well i i guess this is maybe more a question for people in the room because it's a well it's a question about interpretation which is that that slide you showed, which I thought was really striking about where people would look when they were just free to look and where they would look when they had the audio guide. Um, I just wonder if I, if, if I were looking at that data, what I would actually conclude from that? Because in a way, it seems like, oh, it wasn't that one. I think it was the one before. Um, I might conclude that actually the experience of free gaze was, mo was richer because people were looking at more stuff. Um, and and that actually that looks like a like a more impoverished experience of that artwork, um, and I just wonder, yeah, like I just I, I guess I just think it's really interesting that the, there could be a number of ways of interpreting what that is showing, um, and I, I I find well I find that interesting. I can tell you from myself. So, um, the more information I got about the kitchen wall, the more interesting it became for me. So, and without the information, um, so from my point of view, I'd say with the audio guide, the, ex the user experience is, is definitely better. Um, and well, red here doesn't mean it's not the same red as here. So the amount of attention on this red is much higher than here. It's just uh, the normalization issu issue of the colors. So it's uh, again directing people to experiences and what do you make of that? Looking at a little bit of everything, is that a bad thing on your own? Or on the other hand, do you if you want them to focus on particular things and go deeper, but again, have a depth and type of engagement without doing further interviews or observations, I think it's very difficult. It's almost impossible from this to detract. 
But I don't know, the Duke of Ellington was my, mis my kind of fault because when Jan was, we were talking Skyping from Germany, he said, what about Glasgow? What's a really typical image? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so apologies for that. Actually, I think we keep going on what we're interested in, but that's probably one of the safest areas of user interface design. If you have a website and there are thousands of digital images or other things you have, and you haven't designed it that greatly, and your, let's say the starting screen is not designed well, and you have an amazing resource behind, if you don't that do that right, you're not going to enable people to, or encourage them, or entice them to go and look deeper at the other things. So maybe that's a little bit safer and easier to do. What they're getting out of it, and what they're learning, and again, things like that, are much too complex for eye tracking to deal with. But maybe user interface design is maybe quicker and dirtier, but actually more reliable at this stage. Maybe that's something, <laughs> that's my kind of conclusion, but I'm not sure it's something for to discuss. Okay, great. I think we're